you have the privilege this morning of having my pastor from Cornerstone here to, to speak for us. What a privilege it is. I want to welcome Pastor Ron Armstrong. Good morning. It's nice to come in to invite me to, to come and to share with you. The, just before we before I speak to you, uh, first of all, do we have any other pastors here? Oh, yeah. If so, raise your hand. The, Bruce, where do you pastor? Lighthouse Christian Center. Lighthouse Christian Center. Uh, we've got Cameron uh, Lemon over there. Cameron, uh, remind me the, the name of the church. St. Paul City Church. St. Paul City Church. If you have any friends uh, that, are, that grew up Anglican, that don't have a great, uh, wonderful congregation, Cameron's doing a fantastic job over there. Uh, any other... Yes, sir. Pastor of the Spanish Ministry of the Rock Church. At the the Rock uh, here in Temecula. Yes. Wonderful. The, I'm the chaplain of Southwest Detention. Good to have you here. Any any other pastors? Well, I appreciate you you men coming this morning. I uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some very specific relationships. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to First Timothy chapter five. It says in verse 1, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Let's stop there for just a second. The Bible has a lot to say about relationships, doesn't it? And so you've heard a lot of lessons on the subject of relationships. It, in fact, someone tell me, what, is, what does the Bible say? Here, let, we don't have any of our, our wives here this morning. What does the Bible say of how a wife is to relate to her husband? To submit. Go ahead, you can say it. She to submit. To submit. <laughs> <laughs> to submit. And, and I won't tell her you said it, all right? In fact, I think John had a recorder there. Just turn that recorder off, all right? How does the Bible... Say a child is behave towards the parent. Obey. Obey, Obey and they use another word. Honor. 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 Yes. Honor your father and mother. Those it, it talks about relationships, doesn't it? Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a very specific relationship. It's your relationship with your church and your pastor. And so, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 17, and then we're going to fast forward to Hebrews chapter 13. It says in verse 17 of chapter 5, The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. The worker deserves his wages. <coughs> verse 19, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. In the book of Hebrews it says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And do not forget to do good, to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. I'm going to talk to you about this relationship between you and your church, you and your pastor. And to be candid, I can talk about this in ways that a lot of other pastors can't, can't talk about it. The, first of all, how many of you, go ahead and just be honest, how many of you, I am not your pastor. Go ahead and raise your hand. Great. I appreciate you being willing to listen. The, for those of you that I am your pastor, you guys know me well enough to know my heart. You know me well enough to know the, my motives in bringing this type of a message. One person said to me years ago, Pastor Arnold, if I wanted to feel better, I'd probably call someone else, but if I wanted the truth, I'd call you. We're going to deal with some truths today, and some of them won't be pleasant. The, some of them I wouldn't bring other than to a group of men. I can talk about this particular subject because I've been a pastor a very long time. And to be candid, I don't have a whole lot to prove. The, I've been in the same ministry for 21 years. It's a ministry that God has been very gracious to. The, on a personal level, the, I've been married since Noah got off the ark. The, God has blessed me in a, a number of ways. The, I don't really need to, to come and talk anybody into anything. God has already seen to all of my needs. So I'm going to talk to you about some stuff about how your relationship with your pastor is supposed to be. What the Bible says 
is it says that we're to submit to their authority, that we're to obey them, that we're to help them do their ministry in a way that would not be a burden to them. In, a, in one of the translations, it says that so that our relationship with them will not make them sigh. Turn the person next to you and sigh at them. Oh, wait a minute, let's get careful with that sigh. Is. This is not an amorous sigh. This is, here, let me, let me rephrase. Give them the exasperated sigh. Go ahead. Friends, the, the Bible specifically says that we are, we are not to interact with our pastor in a way that makes them sigh. There have been way too many examples in my ministry when someone did something and it was shared with me and I had that, oh Lord, that reaction to it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Our relationship with our church and our pastor is supposed to be something that brings mutual joy. The, one of the, the things that I've learned over the years is in the final analysis, when life gets really hard, it's going to be your church that carries you through it. The, when things just absolutely fall apart, when you feel like there's absolutely no hope, when you get the diagnosis of, of the really bad stuff for you or your kids or your wife, it's going to be your church that carries you through those times. The, specifically, when tragedy really strikes, it's going to be your pastor that holds your hand as you walk through those dark times. Yesterday, I was sitting in my office and I got a text from Pastor Jeff, one of the men on our staff. And he said, Rachel and Mike Linton are in the lobby. Friends, I'll, I'll be candid with you. That wasn't a text I was glad to have. Because you may have read in the paper the other day about a young man who was killed on a motorcycle just a couple of days ago. That was, that was Rachel and Mike Linton's 36-year-old uh, son. And so the, I got that text and I walked up there just to stand with them and just to pray with them and just to hold them. And during times that when you're going through the dark times, it will be your pastor, it will be your church that stands shoulder to shoulder with you. We need to make sure that we are acting in such a way that their ministry is not a burden, but their ministry is a joy. So because they are going to give an account of their ministry, they are going to be responsible to God in ways that you are not going to be responsible. And so let me walk you through a couple of things. What I'm really looking for is I'm looking for each one of you, whatever church you attend, I'm looking for you to be a pillar of the church. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes a reference there, and I always liked it. He made a reference to Peter, James, and John, and he said those pillars of the church. Now think about it, a pillar is something that holds the church up. A pillar is something that we have this picture of stability in it. What I'm looking for are men who are willing to be pillars of the church. Now, I happen to serve in a church where the church is really kind to me. They are good to me. I am one of those rare pastors that is, is treated well. People are kind to me. I am well paid. Go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, your pastor ought to be well paid. Go ahead and tell them that. The Bible says specifically, what does the Bible say? They are worthy of what? Double honor. Let's not kid ourselves. That's saying you ought to pay your pastor well. Those of you who sit on demon boards, I mean deacon boards, <laughs> have the attitude. Not my boat, brother. <laughs> the attitude. No, no, they should be well cared for. They, I'm looking for men who are willing to be pillars of a local church. I appreciate that we can gather together and enjoy fellowship. But the truth of the matter is, when life gets really tough and you're in the hospital or one of your children is, it'll be your pastor that shows up there. It'll be him who stands with you during those dark times. We should be pillars of the church so that it would be a joy and not a burden to them. We should not be living in a culture where pastors are literally moving from church to church because they are, are just unable to continue on. Let me walk through with you five ideas of how you can be a pillar of the church. The first one is that we are to interact with our pastor in a humble way. Now, I don't know, just, uh, just out of curiosity, the, if I was to ask you, who do you think knows the most in the room about about police work, who, do you, who should we vote for? Dennis! Let's go ahead and vote for Dennis. Do we have any other cops in the room? The, then we'll, we'll vote for Dennis. Why would we do that? Because Dennis does that for a living. Do we have any mechanics in the room? Raise your hand if you're a mechanic. The, let, let's go ahead and say, well, he'd probably know a, a whole lot about mechanicking, wouldn't he? 
The, yes. What, tell the person next to you what kind of work you do. Go tell them. If you've been doing it more than five years, if you've been doing it for ten years, you are probably pretty good at what you do. Let me clear up a couple things for you about church. I don't care what, who your pastor is, but I can tell you your pastor probably knows more about ministry than you do. For the same reason Dennis knows more about being a cop than I do. Same reason he knows more about being a mechanic than I do. It's because he goes down there every day and he studies and he works. He studies to show himself approval, workman who needeth not to be ashamed. He works hard at the things of ministry. You should make the assumption that he probably knows more about pastoring the church than you do. You should make the assumption that when he goes to bed at night, lays his head on the pillow, that he's in prayer for your church every single day of his life. You should make the assumption that he has sweat blood over that church. You should make the assumption that he feels the weight of responsibility of answering to God and giving an account for souls in a way that the average person doesn't. My dad, who pastored the same church for 50 years, a 50-year sentence, the, my, who pastored there for 50 years, as I was getting ready to go out in ministry, in full-time ministry, the pastoring my own church, Dad said to me, he said, Son, you don't understand what it means to carry the whole elephant yet, but you will. And to be honest, when he, as an associate pastor there, if things went wrong, things went right, Dad was always there. Going out and being a pastor somewhere, and those who have churches that have associate pastors, they feel this weight now too. The going out and carrying the whole elephant is something that we should make sure we're aware of. We should deal humbly with our pastors. The, we should make sure that we are communicating to them that we not only value their opinion, but that we are submitted to their authority. I don't mean that we're submitted, that they're supposed to boss us around. I mean that we're to deal humbly with them listening as someone who is receiving a valuable piece of counsel from someone else. The second thing besides that, and let me just say to you, if you've interacted with your pastor and you haven't had a humble attitude, the pillars of churches are either humble or repentant about it. Those are the only two choices. The, there's an awful lot of things that I may hit on today that you'll say, you know, Pastor Ron, I'm really not doing that. That's okay. We have grace. We have repentance for that. Today is a day to recognize it so that we would go out and we would live differently. The first thing is a pillar of the church is humble towards his pastor and respectful towards him. The second thing is that pillar of the church is in ministry in his local church. If you're not involved in regular ministry in your local church, my question is, why not? Why exactly would a, a Christ follower, and looking around this room, we're not, I'm not looking at a, a, a bunch of 14, 15 year old kids, the men of your age and your stature and your maturity, if you're not involved in regular ministry, my question is why not? What exactly are you waiting on? You should be that first person there that has the attitude, no, I, I'm here to minister within my local congregation. Several years ago, I was a, a relatively young pastor and a fairly new dad. And I made the statement, said, yeah, I was babysitting my kids the other day. A lady caught me after the service and said, it's not babysitting when they're yours. <laughs> she just wanted to clear up. I, you know, I kind of said it in that prideful attitude, like, well, yeah, I was doing this for my wife. You know, I was babysitting for her. And that uh, elder sister in the Lord cleared it up for me pretty quick. She said, it ain't babysitting when they're yours. And so, friends, the, we should have the same attitude towards our church. The, if you drive by your church and you notice that the, the lawn is looking kind of shaggy, what exactly should you do about it? Tell the person next to you what exactly you should do about it. You should go home and get your mower and go down and mow the grass. Well, you know, they, I, I, should, I should call the pastor. I should, friends, it, when it's your house, you feel differently about it. We should have the attitude that this is our house Amen. and that right. we are responsible for it. The Bible talks about the, that ministry is something that is to be shared, that we are all to use our gifts, all of us use our abilities. If you're not in ministry, my question to you is why not? And I want to say it to you candidly. If you're not in ministry in your local church, whichever local church you attend, the, you are not being a pillar of the church. 
You are not being that man that God has called you to be. God didn't call you to be an attender of the church. God called you to be a pillar of the church. He's looking for Peter, James, and John. Amen. He's looking for people who have impact in ministry. The, first of all, we're humble with those in leadership over us. We are people who take responsible, not just for the physical plan, but for the ministry of the church. We are in ministry. The third part of being a pillar is this. The, a pillar of the church blocks and defends for his pastor. The, how many of you are football fans? The, you need to know that I, I'm not someone... In fact, those of you that don't know me, if you really want to describe me, I am an A-kid, okay? The, I just, you know, a lot of people don't want to admit that. I'm an A-kid. I'm one of those guys that likes to read everything. The Every man I've ever met was fantastic in sports in high school. I guess I'm the only one that really wasn't, okay? I was bad at pretty much everything. I tried several sports. It really wasn't any good. I'm the guy that, you know, got splintered his, splinters in his butt sitting on the bench, all right? And so, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a huge sports fan, but... This metaphor of blocking and defending for you, pastor, is something that the Bible just lays out fairly plainly to us. We're to be people who defend our pastor. The, just out of curiosity, how many of you know someone where you work that is approaching the 25-year mark with the same company? How many of you know someone at work like that? The Dennis, you probably know. In fact, how many of you know someone working in, in your general frame of influence, someone who's working that's kind of approaching the 30-year mark of retirement. Raise your hand if you know someone like that. The, let's go ahead and, and ask the question, what exactly does the local pastor and an NFL player have in common? The local pastor and the NFL player, what exactly do they have in common? Dashing good looks. Pardon me? Dashing good looks. Dashing good looks. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is they're only going to last six years in the same spot. Wow. And the second thing is they get the crap kicked out of them once a week. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, do you block and defend for your pastor? Do your past if someone comes up and says something negative to you about your pastor, what does the Bible say about that? It gave you some specific instructions here. It said, do not entertain an accusation against an elder absent two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. Are you someone that sits there and takes it all in and then maybe shares it with two or, two or three other people? <coughs> Friends, if you wanted someone to make you feel good, you could have called all kinds of pastors. I am old. I don't need nothing. I am old. I've been in ministry a long time. I don't need to be paid better. I don't need to be treated better. In fact... Good Lord, I'm in the season of ministry of just praying God will send along some Elishas under me so that I can hand off the ministry and go to Florida, okay? <laughs> uh, are you someone who blocks in defense for your pastor? The, that's what you're called to do. The, that their ministry might be a joy and a blessing. This is the guy who's going to stand there and marry your children and bury your loved ones we ought to protect them. It shouldn't be so. Here in the United States, the average tenure of a pastor in a local church is five to seven years. There's something wrong with that. And you know, the, we pat ourselves on the back. Years ago, it was only three years. Those of you, in fact, uh, just uh, those of you who uh, are from a, an Assembly of God background, the average pastor lasted about two years in a local Assembly of God church. Why? Because they got the snot beat out of them so regularly. There weren't people blocking and defending for them. Friends, a pillar of the church says, wait a minute, you're talking about my pastor. You're talking about the guy who's going to show up at my house when things are really bad. You're talking about the guy who's going to sit with you when your marriage is struggling. Let's just be honest. How many of you have ever had any marital struggles before? Can we just be honest about that? If you're married, you've had them. You've been married more than 20 minutes. <laughs> These are the people. Are you blocking and defending for your pastor? Or are you are you the person that when they see man, they just they feel glad when you come towards them? The how many guys you know, have someone who's to, to be quite candid here in the valley? There are not many pastors that have been very long in in their ministry, and that's an indictment not of the pastor. That's an indictment of the churches, friends. The uh, I was talking to Pastor Brian Bell the other day. The, I, I don't know, so we, we're blessed this morning to have several pastors here. The, but the truth of the matter is, there's not many pastors that have been in the pulpit here in the valley, continuously in the same pulpit, for more than 
but a handful of years, 10, 15. Pastor Brian, I was teasing with him the other day. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Brian pastors Calvary Chapel in Marietta. Any, uh, just out of curiosity, anyone here from Pastor Brian's, Pastor Brian's church? Okay. They, then I'll go ahead and talk bad about him. No. Pastor Brian, I was on the phone with him the other day, and I said, you know, Brian, we're going to start calling you Bishop Brian. <laughs> because he's one of the longest serving pastors. He's been continuously in his pulpit for 23 or 24 years. The, I, I've been in mine for about 21 years, friends. That shouldn't be the longest serving pastors in a community. The, I was so appreciative of Pastor Steve. Those of you that remember Pastor Steve Strickman from Rancho Community. Just a pillar in our community because of the longevity of his ministry. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be trading pastors in as often as we trade in our cars. No, ministry ought to be such a joy to them. They ought to have a group of guys around them who are so humble so committed to ministry and so committed to blocking and defending for them that they could not envision ever going anywhere else. To be honest, the, I always prayed, Lord, I, I will pastor here as long as you want me to. The, however, however long that is, just please don't ever make me go pastor somewhere else because at my church, people block and defend for me and I'm appreciative of it. Friends, are, are you a pillar of the church? Or, or would your pastor, when you're walking towards them, would he feel that, huh, that sigh, that feeling of, oh Lord, what will it be this time? The next thing is a pillar of the church tithes and gives offerings. See, so many churches are starved for resources and starved for resources because of disobedient to God's word. The, we are to be people, and please understand, those of you fellow pastors in the room, please understand, I consider it my primary, one of my key responsibilities to model this in my congregation those of you other men who pastor, you know pastors that don't faithfully tithe. And that is, a, that is just, that's something that, that's beyond the pale. Pastors ought to be there first in giving. And so, are you pay, paying your tithe and giving offerings over and above that? If not, you're going to watch your church continually starve for resources. People always come up with these ideas. Well, you know, we could have a bake sale the, here at the church. We could, we could have a rummage sale here at the church. Friends, everybody starts living in obedience of tithing and giving offerings over and above that. The church doesn't need a bake sale. The church, no, what the church needs is men who are pillars of the church who in obedience are faithful with their tithe and offering. They, I really believe that in our, our culture, we have developed this idea that, well, you know, they're, they're working in ministry. They, they, you know, they can just get by on this. Friends, your pastor ought to be someone who is well-treated. The, there are young men in our community, and I'll be honest with you, the, one of the things that God has privileged me to do, when, in our community, when a young pastor gets the snot beat out of him and thrown under the bus, I typically call him to make sure that he has money to, to get wherever he needs to go, that he has, has someone to, to help him along. God has blessed me with that ability, being an older pastor and being someone that God has blessed. I've been able to do that. Friends, that ought not to be so. The pastors ought to be treated well financially. They, they should be proud of the profession God has called them. Some say, well, no, Ron, it's not a profession. Friends, the, what we want from them is we want them to do ministry in a way that's a blessing in their community. Are you paying your tithe? Are you giving offerings over and above that? A pillar of the church does. The last thing there is a pillar of the church is an encourager to his pastor and to his church. Criticism... And, against popular opinion, criticism is not one of the spiritual gifts. All right? An awful lot of people think that, well, you know what's your spiritual gift? Finding fault. I remember a guy saying that to my dad. The, now my dad was my dad was a, a big guy and he was from Missouri and and you know he he'd studied a lot, but you know it's kind of the old saying you can take the boy out of the country but not the country out of the boy. And and I remember a guy standing in the in the foyer of our church when I was a kid, and I was just a small kid, and, and Dad he passed away about three years ago. He wouldn't have done this later in ministry, but it made an impression on me. He's, the, this man said to him, he said, you know, I really feel like my gift is finding fault with the local church and finding fault with the pastor just to help him stay in line. <laughs> now, my dad, I remember him looking at him for a second, and he turned and looked at him and got right up nose to nose with him and he said, my job 
is, as a shepherd of this congregation, to run off people like you. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. You say, oh, Pastor Ron, you know that? And I'm saying that later on in life, he might have handled it in more spiritual terms and all that. But to be quite candid, the, I appreciated his honesty there. The, at our church, we teach that criticism is not one of the spiritual gifts. We should be encouragers. That, how many of you guys are married? Raise your hand if you're married. You need to know one of your primary jobs is as an encourager to your spouse. The, we live in a culture that where we have raised multiple generations of women who have had almost no relationship with an appropriate earthly father to where they cannot picture in their minds what the relationship with God is supposed to look like. The, whenever I see a, a woman really, really struggling, if she comes in, she and her husband come in and talk to me, the, I'll separate them and I'll ask her, talk to me about your relationship with, with your dad. And it is such a common story of how they tell, you know, I never really had much relationship with my dad. The, there was never any encouragement or dad just wasn't present. My <coughs> wife met her father a grand total in, in her entire lifetime. She saw her father the, when she was 12. She met him when she was about 14. Those are the only two occasions in her life that she's ever actually come into eyesight with her father. Friends, the, we are dealing with a, a generation that has been raised up with almost no encouragement. The women in our culture, men in our culture, those of you who are dads, they please understand, a primary role of a dad is an encourager. The primary role of a husband is that of an encourager. The Bible says, provoke not your children to anger. The, in other words, it's not just, well, we won't do this. It's the positive that we put into them. And I, please understand, I'm, I'm one of those old school, when my boys were little and they'd get in trouble, they got in trouble, all right? It was, it was not, uh, you know, we weren't sitting around talking about everything, some things we were just having out, all right? But giving encouragement <coughs> to one another, that's an important role. Here are the, the pillars of the church as I see them. They are people who are humble towards their pastor. They are people who are in ministry. They are people who block and defend for their pastor. They are people who give their tithes and offerings faithfully. And they are encouraging to their pastor. In other words, when they see their pastor coming, there's a, I am blessed at Cornerstone, we have a, a few retired pastors. But to be candid, a lot of pastors really don't like retired pastors in their congregation because they've been so beat up by ministry. By the time they get to those retirement years, often they are, they're just wounded and broken and some of them a little bit bitter. But I, I've been blessed in having some retired pastors in the congregation. who have been a huge blessing to me. But there's one that, that he, man, he's, I don't know how tall he was years ago, but man, every year he's just getting a little bit smaller. I'm getting taller. I don't know what happened. But you know, he's only about this big and white-headed. But every single week, he comes by, and it doesn't matter how bad the sermon was. And let's just be honest, some sermons suck, okay? You know, the, we'd like to pretend that they're all, you know, Spurgeon sermons, and someone ought to put them and bind them in a book. We'd like to pretend that. But some of them are just bad. But every single week, he comes up and finds something from the sermon. Did you know in all the years he's been there, he's never come up and made a suggestion to me? Not one time. Say, so, well, Ron, you know, an older pastor like that, he would be he would be such a blessing as a suggestion. No, he recognizes as an older retired pastor, he recognizes the biggest need that I have isn't for another suggestion. He recognizes the biggest need that I have is encouragement. See, some of you as husbands and fathers, you're making that error, aren't you? Mm. You think that the biggest need they have is a suggestion. It was in the Wall Street Journal here about two months ago. The... Uh, the Clearly, a secular publication, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the Bible. In the Wall Street Journal, it said this. He said, let me give you my advice. Give less advice. <laughs> said it will help your marriage. Oftentimes, we think our, our primary duty in the church or as a husband or a father is to, to give advice. No, no, no. Let's think, if we're going to be pillars in the church, let's think of ourselves as having the role and blessing of being encouragers. Those five things. Are you humble with your pastor? You make the assumption... That man, he is praying over his ministry. They, are you in ministry yourself when the, there's a need in the church, or whether you see a need or not, you find a place to serve? Are you blocking and defending for your pastor? 
Are you bringing your tithe and offering regularly, faithfully? And are you known as an encourager within your church? These are the pillars of the church. The question is whether or not you and I are going to be one. Bow your heads with me for just a minute. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for these men that are willing to come and to hear a hard lesson. Lord Jesus, not everything that, that we need to hear from Your Word always makes us feel wonderful. Sometimes it challenges us. Sometimes it convicts us. And Lord, You know that it's not my job to bring conviction, but Lord, if there's something here that a person needed to hear, I pray Your Holy Spirit would bring it. That, your whole, that we would not be, be so frail that we would be instead men who can hear the Spirit speaking to us saying, I need to be a pillar of my church. God, I pray that out of this room that they would go back to each of their churches with a new determination to be a pillar in their church. That the next time they see their pastor, instead of a suggestion, instead of an idea, they just go up, put their arms around their pastor and say, Pastor, I love you and I am with you. Lord, I pray that, that this next weekend that we would have pastors who are just overwhelmed with the support that they receive from these men, that these men would truly be those pillars. And Lord, and if there's an area where they're not being a pillar, God, we thank You for Your grace. Lord, we're grateful for the ability to come before You and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I haven't been that. God, help me to be that. Lord Jesus, Your Word says Your mercy is new every day. Lord, we're grateful that today we can begin being those men as You have equipped us and You have called us. Lord Jesus, we love You and we ask these things in Your name. Amen. 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 Thanks for having me. Thank you.